So in the early 1940s, uh, there was a, a Polish Catholic nurse named Irina Sendler. During World, World War II, she was a social worker that stood opposed to the Nazi regime in Poland. There was massive concentration camps, and the Holocaust was fierce in Poland. Not only was she opposed, but she was convinced that she had to do something to try and save Jewish children. And through her planning and strategic efforts with other people, she was able to save the lives of over 2,500 Jewish children. She came up with plans on how she could hide kids in trash cans and toolboxes and shipping crates and load them up on trucks and have the delivery driver take these children to different Catholic convents and Catholic homes throughout Poland in order to save these kids' lives. Not only did she do that, but she actually documented all of these kids, gave them uh, false identifications as Polish citizens while keeping track of who they were and who their parents were. So after the war, a lot of these kids could be reunited with their families if, if their families were still alive and were able to survive the Holocaust. She, was, she ended up being arrested uh, by, by the Nazis at one point and brought into uh, a concentration camp and she was tortured and she was, she was doomed to be executed. Uh, but the Polish government came in and intervened in the last hour and saved her life. This woman was dedicated to God. She was dedicated to God. And when the situation was in front of her, of this great evil and children being hurt and killed and taken away from their parents, she felt like she only had one option and that was to obey God. She had to obey God. She had to do whatever she could to save these children's lives. She obeyed God and then just trusted that he was in charge. This came from a deep-seated faith that she had in God and his plan and in the word of God. And this sort of obedience, this sort of faith is what God calls us to. God calls us to obey and trust that he is in charge, right? He calls us to obey and trust that he is in charge. When we think about obeying God, we should not be thinking about, okay, what are the rules? What is the list? What are the things that I need to, to do in order to be okay with God? It, it has nothing to do with that, right? To obey God is to live our lives fully surrendered to him, right? We obey God in everything, in the way that we are to think, the way we speak, the way we live, the way we act. This is what we are called to. This is what discipleship is all about. Jesus even says, if you want to come and follow me, you have to lay down your life. You have to die to yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. And Jesus says uh, elsewhere, or John says, uh, that if you truly love God, you will keep his commandments. Right? If you truly love him, you will obey him. This is what it is. It, it is a motivation from love, not obligation. And then to trust God, it is to have confidence that no matter what he asks us to do, that he's in charge of the outcome. He's sovereign over it. He's in control. Nothing is going to get by him. And when he calls us to obey, we don't need to question, God, are you in charge? We need to trust that and move forward with faith and obey God no matter what the cost. And there are small things. We want to train our kids to do this, right? And as adults, we have massive decisions that we need to make that could affect our entire lives. And as we get older and empty nesters, there's a new season of what does it look like to obey God? What does it look like to pour myself out for Jesus? When I was in seminary, I saw this, uh, this played out in, in, in a great example. It was actually Zach and Carrie Ritz. When we were in seminary, Zach was telling me about a, uh, a friend that he had grown up, his best friend, uh, and that he'd been sharing the gospel with him. And one day, his friend called him and said, hey man, I basically hit rock bottom. He was homeless. He was trying to, to kick addictions that he had. And Zach called him, my friend, you've got to give your life to Jesus. This is what you must do. You must surrender your heart. You must surrender your life to Jesus. And he did. And he did. He, he gave his life to Jesus. And that wasn't enough, Right? Zach and Carrie talked about it, and when they told me, I was like, man, you're crazy. You're crazy right now to do this. But Zach says, I, I think I need to invite him to come live with us. 
Now, we're living in, in seminary in the dorms, and the Ritzes had a two-bedroom apartment that Benaiah and Carrie was pregnant with Judah, and they were planning on taking the second bedroom and making it into a nursery slash toddler room. And they said, no, what we need to do is obey and trust that God is in charge. So they brought Benaiah into their room, and they gave the second bedroom to Zach's friend who lived with them for six months. I mean, this is a very practical way, right, to, to pour yourself out and to say, at this moment, what am I to do? I am to obey God and just trust that he has us. Trust the outcome to him. And we see this sort of thing happening over and over again in Elijah's life. And it's amazing how much of the Christian life is, is, is wrapped up in this simple statement, right? Obey God and trust him that he's in charge. That answers so many questions that we have. So much confusion, we begin to try to uh, analyze every situation and try to say, well, what, what should I do here? What should I do there? And at the end of the day, obey God. It's really not as confusing as we make it out to be. In fact, the only reason it's confusing is because we don't like to obey God. We want to figure out a different way. So as we look at 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to see an example of what it looks like to obey God without knowing what the future looks like, without having any guarantees of what could come, but trusting that God is in control. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, or excuse me, 8 through 16 this morning. So last week we began the story of Elijah. And we were introduced to some of the characters in the plot, right? There was evil King Ahab, uh, is the king of the northern Israel, uh, the northern kingdom in Israel, uh, and he married this awful, evil woman named Jezebel who came to Israel from Sidon where her father is king and she does not worship Yahweh. She does not worship the God of the Bible. She worships Baal. And when she comes to Israel, she does not leave Baal worship in Sidon, right? She takes it with her. She brings it and Ahab adopts it. And they build temples and they build altars and they, 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 uh, have worship services for Baal, even sacrificing children to Baal. And God calls Elijah to prophesy and tell King Ahab that a drought is coming and it will last for many days. And this drought is going to affect everything. In fact, it is a severe famine. Jesus calls it a severe famine uh, in Luke's gospel. And it goes and it spreads to all the regions. And the interesting thing about this particular prophecy is that Baal was the god of rain. He was the god of dew. He was the god that would bring fertility to crops. And by Elijah telling Ahab there's going to be a drought, he was basically challenging Baal. And this didn't go very well for uh, Elijah because Ahab and Jezebel wanted to kill him. As soon as they started to experience, oh my gosh, there is no rain, our crops are going to start to die, Elijah, you're the one that did this, we're going to get you. So God brings Elijah out into the wilderness, he hides him in, uh, next to a brook called Kareth, and he had these ravens come and feed him bread and, uh, uh, bread and meat every morning and every evening. So what is Elijah to do now? When the brook dries up, we see this in 1 Kings 17, verse 7, that the brook dried up and he could no longer stay here. So what is Elijah to do now? He could starve to death if he stays there. What is he to do? He can't go home. Ahab and Jezebel are looking for him. They want to kill him. So he trusts God, and God, as he always does, is so faithful and speaks to Elijah. And we see what God says in verses 8 and 9 of 1 Kings 17 says this, then the word of the Lord came to him, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Now, the first thing we should notice here is like, God, you want him to go where? You want him to go to Sidon? Zarephath is a, a city of Sidon. Sidon is where Jezebel is from. Sidon is the devil's den if you would. This is where Baal worship was the strongest. Baal ruled this area, and God wants him to escape Jezebel and Ahab and find nutrition and to be fed 
And out of all the places he could go, he sends them to Sidon. God is calling Elijah to go to Baal's home turf. Remember, Elijah's prophecy is against Baal and against his power. And it has caused a drought that has spread beyond Israel. It has spread into Sidon, which we'll see in just a little while. So these Baal worshipers, who the king is actually related to Jezebel, uh, they know about Elijah, right? Yet God is saying, go to Sidon. This would be like uh, the, the Catholic nurse, uh, Arena Sendler, s- trying to hide kids by sending them to Berlin in World War II, right? Right in the heart of Nazi Germany. Hey, go and live there, dwell there, hide there. But it wasn't that he was just to go and hide in Sidon, right? He doesn't say, hey, go and, and hang out there for a little bit. God tells him to go there and dwell, to dwell in Sidon. And this is not referring to a vacation. This is not referring to a short stay. To dwell is to put down roots. It is to, hey, get comfortable. You're going to be here for a while. Elijah is updating his personal information in his mailing address by living in Sidon. And this seems very odd to him. But, hey, it gets better. He says, don't worry. I'm going to provide a widow to feed you. And this is the part that's almost even more ironic and funny, uh, the fact that God would raise up a widow to feed the prophet, a widow from Sidon. But to understand the context of Sidon and, and, and how crazy it is for Elijah to be there, we have to know what's going on back in Israel. Right? He's, he's hiding from Jezebel and from Ahab, um, and as he goes into the wilderness, Jezebel, all she sees is red. She's furious. She wants to see Elijah die. In fact, she sends messengers, her and and Ahab, send messengers to all the kingdoms and all the nations looking for Elijah. And then if they said he's not here, it would make them sign an oath promising that if 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 we find out that Elijah is here, you sign this oath and you will die. Right? They send him out. She is turning the world upside down looking for Elijah. But not only that. She gathers all the prophets of Yahweh and Israel and begins to slaughter them, to massacre all the prophets, except for about a hundred, which Obadiah hides in a cave, and we'll get to that in a couple weeks. But other than these few prophets, the rest of them she kills. And God says to Elijah, go to Jezebel's hometown and live there, and we'll find a widow that will help you, that will feed you. Elijah is number one on Jezebel's most wanted list. Again, this would be uh, a very difficult thing to obey if, if you're Elijah. Right? This would be very difficult if God said, hey, go to Sidon. I've, I'll take care of you there. It's like, man, I, I have to make a decision here, and I need to trust, God, that you are in control. But hey, if you can feed me from ravens, I guess you can take care of me in Sidon. So he goes. And God tells them that a widow will feed him. Now, food is a really big deal at this time. There's a drought. There's a famine. Uh, We find out that even Ahab back in Israel begins to get nervous, and he starts going out and scouring lands looking for grass to feed the livestock. Things are really bad because of this famine, uh, and and Elijah feels that as well. But a, a widow will take care of you. We've seen God supernaturally provide in the past, and he's going to have to do it again. But this time it's not going to be ravens, though Elijah would probably have better luck with ravens than a widow in Iron Age Israel, right? To be a widow was a dead-end street. There was no uh, night school. There was no home businesses for widows to try to make a better life for themselves. To be a widow was to, to just barely scrape by. It's to live with dirt under your fingernails and, and, and just trying to figure out how do I survive till next week. Especially when there's a famine, it gets even worse. But God calls Elijah to obey and to trust that he's in charge. Yet God, as happens over and over again in the story of Elijah, decides to to show up and show off on behalf of Elijah and on behalf of his people and through the widow. He doesn't stop to... uh, to question whether or not this widow is able to feed. He doesn't question God saying, Lord, why not, why not send me to a family, a Christian family here? Why can't I stay there? Why can't I go to a farm? Uh, why does it have to be a widow? 
And we see what happens in the next couple of verses. Look with me at verses 3 and following. 1 Kings 17, verse 3, it says, So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. That we may eat it and die. You see, this woman was lacking the ability to, to save herself and to save Elijah, to give him what he wanted, to give him some bread, to help him be sustained. Yet we see God doing marvelous things with people who are in very difficult circumstances. And this is how God works, right? I mean, he, he uses the small things to raise up uh, great, powerful people. He uses difficult situations to bring maximum glory to himself. We see this in the life of the disciples, right? He goes and he, he gathers these fishermen and carpenters and people who uh, would not necessarily be at the top of the list. And he uses them to turn the world upside down. And it's like God was looking over all of Sidon and over all Israel and he goes, I'm going to find the weakest, the most helpless person. And I'm going to raise her up and I'm going to use her as an instrument in my hand to bring maximum glory to myself. And this is just how God works. And this is also good news for us. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He echoes this sentiment. He says, for, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many, of, uh, not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God is not looking for the biggest and the strongest. He's not looking for the smartest and the richest. He's not looking for the best looking and most talented. He is looking for men and women that are willing to faithfully pour themselves out to God, to obey him, to trust that he is in charge. He's looking for men and women who are willing to, to live their lives surrendered to his kingship. He's looking for men and women and children that are willing to forsake all others and all else and say, God, I will follow you no matter what. I will follow you no matter what. This, these are the people that God uses. He stoops down and finds the most humble and says, I'm going to use this widow who we're still talking about today, 3,500 years later. Uh, I'm going to use this widow to save the life of my prophet. Our call is to offer ourselves to God in the same way. And it is God's prerogative whether or not he wants to use us like he did the widow or he wants to use us like he does Elijah. So many of us, we have in our minds, man, I want to be this great hero of the faith. I want to be an Elijah figure. But Elijah would be dead if it wasn't for the widow. Right? God uses the widow to save Elijah. And this is how the body of Christ works. Right? Right? Paul uses this analogy often. The, the, the people of God, we work together like a body. And the hand should never be jealous of the foot. The hand should never be saying, man, I wish I was a foot. The foot gets to go all these places. We're never to be jealous of one another, right? And the eye is to never judge the mouth. To say, man, you, you're just a, a lowly mouth. You should be an eye up here. Right? The people of God, we get into such a, a pattern of comparing ourselves to one another instead of aspiring toward a unified body that is working together to bring maximum glory to God. This is what we're called to do. We are a body that works together to bring glory to God. So these are the questions we must ask. Am I faithful like Elijah to follow God's command even to Sidon? When it doesn't make sense, 
when things are fearful, when things feel anxious, when you feel stressed or unrest about something, but you know what God is calling you to do, are you willing to take that step and follow God no matter what? Because you trust that he's in charge. He's not going to let you go. Will we be like the, the widow, which we're going to look at in just a moment in more detail, but will we be like the widow who at the end of the day says, I have just a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, and you know what? This is for me and my son as our last meal. This is it. I'm not, I'm not going to give it away. This is, this is my last bit. No longer are we, going to, are we going to wrestle and strive to find food for ourselves. We have come to our end. We are about to die. And this is our last meal. And now here comes Elijah asking for that food. Will we follow God? Will we obey him no matter what the cost? So when Elijah met the widow, he walks in to Sidon, the devil's den, and he comes to the gate. God said, there's a widow there waiting for you. She's going to feed you. And he walks in, and he, he looks around, and he, he sees the widow by the gate picking up sticks. And I bet at that time, Elijah probably looked up in the air and said, man, I hope there's some ravens around here because this woman is not going to be able to help me. This is not the type of person that I'm going to go up to and ask for food. God, you're going to need to do this a different way. Um, we, this is the type of lady, I need, I need to give her something, right? She's about to die of starvation because of this famine. She's out collecting a few sticks by the gate to build a fire to cook a couple biscuit cakes for her last meal. Elijah would have looked at her and seen her as skinny as can be, malnourished, starving to death, just trying to figure out how do I, what do I do? There, there's hopelessness in this woman. She has no hope in her life. Again, it is a dead road. It is a dead end street. Yet Elijah has to be obedient as well. So Elijah goes up to her and asks her for some water. He asks her not only for water, but hey, bring me some cake as well. Bring me some cakes as well. And this woman is now in a predicament. Elijah promised that, hey, if you do this, you're going to be all right. Trust me, trust God. If you give me the cake, you will have food. You will not run out of oil and flour, but you need to obey. And now the woman is here trying to figure out, okay, what do I do? Now we, we need to, before we continue this, this narrative of, of what the woman does and, and how Elijah responds and how God shows up faithfully, we need to ask the question, and we, we've touched on it a little bit, why did he go to Sidon? Why did he go to Sidon? Why did God send him there? There were widows. There were widows in Israel he could have gone to. If God can hide them in Sidon, the enemy territory, the, the Berlin, if you would, of Nazi Germany, if, if he can hide them there, he could hide them in his hometown. He could hide them. There were still some faithful prophets. He could have, he could have hid in the cave with, with the others, like uh, Obadiah when he hid the other prophets. Why Sidon? And also, why a widow? You know, we, we believe that every detail in the Bible is inspired and very important. And oftentimes, it's these small things that we read over quickly, and we miss the, the grand glory of the stories. So we need to find out, why is it Sidon, and why a widow? Well, I think there's two reasons. One is to show God's power over Baal yet again. And two, because this is just how the gospel works. Right? This is how the gospel works. So why Sidon? Why did God send him to Sidon? Why did he walk into that gate, into this city, and say, okay, this is my new home? Why was it there? Well, Zarephath, which is a, a city in Sidon, if we thought about Sidon as Wichita, uh, Zarephath might be like Bel Air or something, right? It, it's kind of in it, uh, but not really a part of it, but it's, it's, it's underneath Sidon, right? Sidon rules in this area. Uh, and, and Zarephath was known for three things historically, right? And, and they're very interesting. This is a, a wealthy area. Uh, they are known for producing purple dye for dyeing clothes. Now, this is a color of royalty. And the reason kings wore purple and uh, people with royalty wore purple was because it was the most expensive dye to make. And it took a certain amount of artistry and time and effort to make this dye. And Zarephath was known for being a producer of purple dye. Royalty, money involved with that. 
Not only that, but they produce some of the best wine, which is also a, a drink of kings, right? Kings drink wine. Uh, so right here we have Zarephath being a supplier of things that kings like to enjoy. And then the final one is that Zarephath produced some of the finest olive oil. Olive oil. They were known for producing olive oil, which was used in everything. And I think it's interesting how this, this city in Sidon um, that God sends Elijah to is known for these three things because, first of all, uh, as a Baal worshiper, like Israel, they would look at Baal and say, you are king. You had other kings, but they served Baal. In fact, they would even be named after Baal. Jezebel's dad, was named, uh, his name was Ethbal, or Ethbaal, right? It was, it was combining the deity and the king, saying, uh, we work together, but Baal is the ultimate king. So God sends Elijah to this city that produces kingly things, like purple dye and wine. And then he sends, uh, he sends Elijah to a widow uh, who is all out of oil, and she lives in this area that produces oil. And you see, what we find out happening is that uh, Baal is incapable of helping the people. Their great king has failed. This is kind of the irony in the story a little bit, that the, the woman, the widow, is all out of oil. She only has enough for that last cake. And God sends Elijah there to do a miracle as it so we have Yahweh entering into Baal's territory and showing himself to be more powerful, more glorious, and more great than Baal himself. He is able to pr provide for a widow what Baal was unable to provide. And it shows that God's kingship is a kingship with no borders, right? God was not interested in just staying in Israel. He went with his people. Where his people are, his kingdom reigns. He is a king without borders. He goes into any nation, any country, any kingdom, any stronghold, and he will show himself more powerful than anyone else. This is what God does constantly. And this is the power that Jesus sends his disciples out within the Great Commission. He says, listen, all authority has been given to me. Now go into all nations, all kingdoms, all companies, all schools, all demographics, and show my authority. Show my salvation. Bring my power to the world. There are no borders. There's nothing that can stop you. If you obey me in this, I will be with you. Right? So we can walk into any room of any business in any country, and we can proclaim the power of the gospel. And we have full confidence that Jesus Christ is present, and he reigns and he rules, and he will conquer even the, the bales of the world. Jesus has authority. God has authority. Yahweh has authority over all. So why Sidon? To show God's power over the Baals. Not only does, not only does Elijah going to Sidon show God's power over Baal, but it also shows judgment on Israel. Because Yahweh is no longer showing himself powerful in Israel. Because Israel has basically become Sidon with what Ahab has been doing. Uh, no longer is this a, a faithful place. So for Elijah to go to Sidon and God to show himself faithful there was actually judgment on Israel. And it's a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, right? God promises that Abraham, through your seed, you will be a blessing to all the nations. And now, Abraham's seed, Elijah, the prophet of God, is a bringing a blessing to this widow in Sidon. So why the widow? Why the widow? I would say because this is how the gospel works. This is how God tells stories. It models the gospel. You see, God sent Elijah to a Gentile nation to save the life of a Gentile widow who was unable to save her own life. She was about to die, right? God has sent Jesus into a dark, depraved world, a Gentile nation, uh, to save Gentiles who are enslaved to sin and are unable to save ourselves. Right? This, this is the story of the gospel. God has entered into the devil's den in order to save you, in order to save me. This is what he does. And in fact, Jesus makes this connection in his ministry in Luke chapter 4. Jesus says, I'm going to use the story of Elijah and the widow 
to set up what I'm doing here. This shows the incarnation of Jesus entering from his home to a broken world in order to save people who are unable to save themselves. Look with me at Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16. It says this, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. He was raised there. And as, he was, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, when we think about Elijah and Elisha after him, they are known as the prophets who had the Spirit of the Lord. Right? This is, Elijah is a Spirit-empowered prophet. And now Jesus is saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. This is essentially Elijah's ministry to the widow. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your sight, or in your hearing. Skip down to verse 24. It says this, And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Now the reason Elijah had to leave Israel is because he was no longer acceptable in his hometown. Right? They kicked him out. They drove him out. No prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Verse 25. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. Right? There were many widows in Israel. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Now, if we were to continue this story, it's fascinating because those in the synagogue get really, really upset with Jesus. In fact, they get so mad at him, they form a mob and they drag him to a cliff. And they're about to throw him off the cliff. And God, supernaturally, allows Jesus to escape with this interesting verse that says, and he walked amongst them and escaped. So it's as if they just, they lost him, right? But why was Israel so upset? When Jesus said this, when Jesus says, I'm modeling my ministry after Elijah, why were they so upset? It's because when they look back at the story of Elijah, which they knew well, and King Ahab and Jezebel, nobody liked Ahab. He was awful. No one liked Jezebel. It was unanimous. Everybody says they, they were horrible. They were horrible. And now Jesus is saying to Israel, Prophets have no honor in their hometown, referring to himself. And they start thinking, well, that's like Elijah. And then Jesus goes on to say it. And he says all this to justify his ministry going to those outside of the covenant people, to going to Gentiles, to go to those people who could not save themselves. And when Israel heard this, they wanted to kill him because they thought, if if you're going to Gentiles and you're saying you're like Elijah, that means I'm Ahab. That means I'm I'm Ahab, I'm Jezebel. That means God's judgment is on us, and we're not okay with that. And they take him to the cliff, and they want to throw him off. But by God's grace, he has survived. You see, the story of Elijah and the widow model and, and, and show us the incarnation of a loving God entering into our brokenness, finding us picking up sticks, trying to figure out how do I live one more day? Unable to do anything for ourselves. And he comes and he saves us. The Apostle Paul emphasizes the same truth in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Paul says this. He says, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him 
from the wrath to come. And in verse 10, he says this, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Right? So, so what does Paul tell us here? Right? He says, listen, you, you as, as, as broken people, unable to save yourself, God entered into your world while you were still weak. Right? While you were still weak. This widow was as weak as they come. This widow had no strength. She was helpless, unable to serve others or herself. She could not do anything. He goes on to say, and he came to us while we were still sinners. And this widow was a Gentile woman living in Sidon. Probably definitely had a history of Baal worship outside the covenant people of God. And in our stories, that's where we exist until Jesus comes in and saves us. Right? This woman was weak. She was a sinner. And not only that, Paul says that while we were enemies, he saved us. We are not just outside of God's covenant, but we are opposed to him and his ways. We are children of Baal, and he purchased us while we are still his enemies. On the cross, Jesus did everything that needed to be done to bring us into fellowship, to bring us to his table so that we can feast with Jesus. Jesus came into the heart of of, of a broken sinner, a, a, a Baal-worshipping, idol-erecting uh, heart that wants nothing to do with God. And he top, toppled them all down in order to save us. Just as Elijah went to Sidon and saved the widow, so Jesus comes into our broken world to save us. Now, if we notice in this passage, Elijah asked for everything from this woman, Right? Now we're back there. They're in the courtyard right outside the gate. She's got sticks in her hands. He says, go get me some water. She does that. And then as she's going, he says, hey, bring me a, a cake as well. Bring me a biscuit. Bring me some food. I'm hungry. I've been traveling. And she responds by saying, listen, this, this is all I have, I swear. I, I, I have nothing else. I have a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour. And I plan on going home, making a cake, feeding it to myself and my son, and then we're going to die. We're going to starve to death because there's nothing else. But Elijah still asks her. He still asks her for the cake. He says, bring me a cake first. Well, look with me at verses 13 uh, through 16. It says this, And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. All right? He says, don't fear. I know you have nothing left. But don't fear. Go do what you're going to do. But first, bring me some food. Bring me some food so I can eat it. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. We would say, Elijah, come on, man. You see her. You see the condition that she's in. Surely you can wait a little bit longer. Why are you forcing her now to feed you first? Let's keep reading and then we'll come back. He says in verse 14, For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And, she, and he and her and her household ate for many days. Verse 16, The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. All right, so this, we know where the story goes. The widow did not, right? The widow here is saying, this is an unreasonable command. You're asking me to bring you all that I have and trust that what you're saying is true. I mean, could you imagine her emotion uh, when, when she goes home and she takes that last scoop of flour and puts it into the bowl and pours out that last bit of, of oil She's thinking to herself, God, I don't have enough to feed a guest. And God would respond, I know, I know, but pour it out, right? God, I, I don't have enough money here to even clothe my son. I know, I know, but pour it out. God, I, I don't have enough time in my day to, to serve my neighbors. I know, but pour it out. Be obedient. 
God, I, I don't have enough time to get up in the morning and come and serve at church. I know, it's been a long weekend. But pour it out. Walk by faith. Obey God and trust that he is in charge. God is saying, I, I know, I know what you have. Elijah knew what she had. He's saying, I know. But first, obey. First, we give all of our lives and our possessions and our time, and we dedicate it to God first. We give it to him. First fruits. He is worthy of all. He owns all, so we offer all. We sacrifice all to him. And if we say, God, I have nothing left, he'll say, I know, but just keep going. Because God is in charge, and he's faithful always. This is our call as Christians. This is, our, this is what it looks like to love Jesus. When he says, lay down your life, pick up your cross, and follow me, the response is not to say, God, listen, Jesus, I'll follow you, and I, I'm willing to, 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 be, to be hurt, to have a cramp in the leg. I'm willing to not get enough sleep, but to actually lay down my life, I can't do that. And Jesus would say, I know. <laughs> I know, but do it anyways. You see, the cool thing about this story is that Elijah asks the widow for everything that she has. For everything that she has. He demands it from her. Bring me the cake first. But what we see happening in the story is that Elijah ultimately gives her far more than he ever demanded from her. Right? He gives her so much more than he required. God has given us his spirit. He has empowered us that if we obey him, we fall down before him and say, it is all yours, God. I have nothing left. He'll say, I know, but keep going because I have so much more I want to give you. You see, if this widow would have said, Elijah, this is what I would rather see happen. I only have a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. I don't really know you. Um, how about you let me make this last cake for me and my son and then if your miracle comes true then I'll make you one right I, I, I'll, I'll try to pour some out afterwards I'll try to get some more oil though I know I'm, I'm out and and if you're faithful if your God is faithful then you can have what's left over right and this is how we we like to work so often the time God I know you want me uh, to have this conversation um, I know it would be obedient to go and confront this brother or sister in Christ about uh, a sin that I see or uh, something that's, that's not right. But God, I need you first to give me some courage, <laughs> right? I need you to take away these nerves. I need you to prepare me, prepare my heart, prepare their heart, you know, the, all the Christian prayers that we have uh, to do this. And God is thinking, just obey. You, you know, when we look at the scriptures, there's no ambiguity around that. If we see a brother and sister ensnared in sin, we enter into that space and we try to help them. We try to rescue them. We don't need to pray for a certain amount of courage. We just need to obey and trust that God is in charge and that he will give us what we need in the time uh, we need it. Right? Th this, is, this is such a powerful thing that we see all throughout the Bible, yet we fail to live it. We fail to live this out constantly. God, if I have some extra money at the end of the month after I pay my bills, after I uh, rent my movies and download the certain apps and uh, go out to eat a few times. With the money that's left over, I will give you some, some money at church, right? But to obey is to give our all to God. It is to say, God, it is all yours. What would you have me give? And obey him and trust that he's in charge and trust that he's going to take care of you. Same thing with relationships or struggles or work or sharing the gospel with somebody. It, it seems very strange to me at times when when I hear, I'm really praying for an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, with my coworker. So, well, I mean, are you going to see him tomorrow at work? Oh, yeah. Well, there's your opportunity, you know? Like, but no, 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 I need, I need just the right opportunity. I need the, the, the setting to be okay. The, sometimes there's hostility there. I, I need that to be gone. And we set up this whole thing of if all of these things are just right, then I'll pray that God fills me with courage. And then I'll go and share the gospel, Right? But in the Bible, that's not what we see. We see God's people walking by faith, obeying the commands. We are to proclaim the gospel wherever we go. 
make disciples, and we step into that space, when we say, here I am, I'm obeying God, I, my knees are shaking, I feel like I'm going to throw up about to have this conversation, but Lord, I, I am confident, I trust that you are in charge, and that you're going to hold on to me, that you're going to take care of me. The widow is a beautiful model of faithful obedience. And this is a call for us. Are we going to live lives of faithful obedience? Are we going to pour ourselves out, pour out that last bit of flour and oil because that's what it means to obey God? Or will we try to make our own plans? So often we think about obedience to God as being optional. We will obey God as long as it fits our schedule. Right? As long as it doesn't interfere with what I already have planned, I'll obey God. I'll pour myself out as long as I have enough in the tank, as long as I've got enough in reserve. I mean, this, this is a perfect analogy, and we say this often. I've got to stop. I just don't have anything left. I know. I know. But you're called to obey. And to, to obey is to follow God's commands. It is to lay your life down out of love for him and receive his love and trust that he will fill you up. The widow poured everything out and trusted that God would fill everything back up. This is what, was, this is, what is required of followers of Jesus. We will use some of our flour and some of our, our oil to feed others as long as I know I have enough to make it through the rest of the week. You see, we turn obedience to God into some existential debate over what is the greatest good, right? What is the greatest good at this moment? God says, love your neighbor. Okay, my neighbor is miserable. Not mine, I have great neighbors. But we might say, my neighbor is miserable. I, I, I don't want to love them, and I don't have to love them because they're not lovable, <laughs> right? God, if you want me to do this, then you need to make this person lovable because my personal comfort and rest and security and and all of that is more important to me it's the greater good than obeying what you've said to love my neighbor god tells us to serve one another we say i'm happy to serve as long as it doesn't cut into my sleep as long as it doesn't cut into my me time i'm happy to serve one another but i I've got a day out of the month that I will dedicate to serving as long as it's not too hot out, you know. If you wanted to move yesterday, I'm not showing up. It's miserably hot, right? And God would say, I know, I know, I know it's hot. And I know you don't want to do these things, but obey and trust that God will fill you up. Trust that he is in charge. He will preserve you. When we think this way, when we try to figure out what is the greatest good as it relates to me, uh, this is no longer worship of God, this is worship of self, <laughs> right? This is no longer saying, God, I'm going to obey you. This is, I'm going to obey me. I'm going to do what I want to do. What is at risk if we, if we live that life? I mean, what is at risk if we decide, I, I don't want to obey God? Like that, that's something we really need to wrestle with. Now, we fail to obey constantly, and God's grace is is wonderful, and his mercy is rich and everlasting. However, that's different than saying, you know what? I don't want to obey. I don't want to do the things that you're telling me I should do. I was thinking this morning of the story uh, in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira, where they said, I, I, want, I want to obey God. And, and this is what we do, right? We put on a mask saying, when everybody looks at me, they're going to think that I'm a good Christian and I'm obeying God. And this is exactly what Ananias and Sapphira did. They sold a field and they bring a portion of the money to the disciples and say, here is all the money I got for selling the field. And Peter looks at them and says, why, why have you let Satan influence you? Why are you lying to me? Was it not your field before and is not the money all yours now? Why are you making it sound like you have just given God all of it when you've only given him a fraction? And in that moment, Ananias drops dead. And what Peter maybe, maybe did not know is that Ananias and his wife Sapphira actually plotted together saying, okay, this is how we're going to look like we're obedient, but we're putting this in our 401k that has a really nice return 
um, and we're going to be able to retire off of this. This was the plan all along. So I'm, I'm going to leave a chunk here. She's like, yes, I like this plan. She comes in later, and Peter says, you know, did you give us all the money from the field? Yes, I sure did. He goes, well, outside the door are the people who just dragged your husband out dead, and the same is about to happen to you, and she falls down dead. All right, I mean, and we look at this oftentimes and say, oh, this is just a, almost a weird kid story uh, of the Bible, a moral tale, but it shows the seriousness of what it looks like to be devoted to God. You know, do, do we walk in here and, and tell one, other, one another, man, this last week I have spent myself. I have, I have served on all these things and whew, look at me and in the back of our mind saying, actually, I know I didn't. I, I mean, they saw me do this, and they saw me do that, so I'm going to present myself as something that I'm not. You know, in the confession, we said, God, we are hypocrites, right? And Jesus is the answer to our hypocrisy. We are to pour ourselves out for one another, because if we don't, we miss out on the blessings. We miss out on God's work in our lives. If that widow would have made the cakes for her son and herself, and not Elijah, if she would have done that first, disobeyed, that would have been her last meal. But she didn't. She obeyed, and God showed himself to be trustworthy and in charge. If we do not obey God, we are at risk of missing blessing, but we are also rebellious to our king. And the kingship of Jesus matters. He go, he's the one that goes into Sidon and shows himself strong over, the, over Baal, He's the one that says all authority on heaven and earth is mine. And whether we recognize that or not, we are under his authority. And to not obey is to be in rebellion to the king. And in this story, there's one, two characters that are certainly in rebellion, and that's Ahab and Jezebel. All right? They're the model of what it looks like to be in rebellion to God. We are called to pour ourselves out, to trust God, to follow him, to obey him. And know that he will fill us up. We are to gather together weekly for worship. And we trust God that he will provide the time to rest. That he'll provide the time to go fishing. That he'll provide the time to have a vacation. And the time to have me time. We must obey and meet together on Sundays as God's people. And sing to him and to hear him and to feast with him and to confess together and be assured together. This is what it is to be a follower of Jesus. And when we say, you know what, I'm going to skip all that and I'd rather sleep in because it's been a busy week and I wasn't able to sleep in on Saturday. So I'm going to use Sunday to sleep in. Man, this is not faithful discipleship. This is saying my, my greatest good is ultimately what I'll follow. And it's rebellion to the king. We're told to give of our finances and to trust God that he will sustain us. And we can trust God that he will, and we can trust him that he will give us wisdom on what to give of our time or our talents or our treasure. But we are to obey and trust that he is in charge. Like Elijah and the widow, Jesus has given us far more than he demands from us. He has given us so much more than he demands. If we pour ourselves out, if we give him everything, he's giving us so much more in return. This is how God works. He's already given you more than you could ever even imagine. You have a massive inheritance awaiting you as a child of the king, and you have no clue what's in store. He's already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outserve God. You cannot pour yourself out to the point of being empty and not have God there promising to fill you back up. This is the God we serve. Pour out all the flour, all the oil. That this is it. I know. And keep pouring it out, and I will continue to let it flow. She fed her family and a guest for three years on nothing. Every time she reached in, there was flour there. Every time she poured out the oil, it was there. She didn't need to make excuses as to why she didn't have enough food. Because it's always there. God is faithful. And may we, like the widow, obey and trust God. May we obey what our king calls us to do. 
And let us not be people who try to justify reasons to disobey. And let us not be people who try to find excuses as to why this doesn't necessarily apply to me. But let us be faithful disciples of Christ. Let us, with faith in God, who is able to keep us and sustain us, let us pour ourselves out in obedience of the King and trust with joyful confidence that he is in charge and that he will fill us up. Let's pray.